Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over the UFC card for this weekend coming from Vegas. Uh, again, for those of you that weren't around for last weekend, that was obviously really exciting. Got to play it out my live final um, uh, lineup, and although I was unable to actually attend, obviously I was still able to play, and we ended up with a very, very fortunate third for 60000 uh, which completed a very, very long road between all the qualifiers and stuff. And one of these days, actually, I probably should do a full recap of it uh, because I do think it was interesting. Um, if for no other reason, for my own, my own therapy. Uh, nonetheless, we are back for a regular card and uh, back to the pure GPP approach. And we're also going to do a, um, a betting breakdown uh, probably tomorrow. And that has proven to be quite a bit of fun. Uh, for those of you that, that tailed some of the last weeks, for example, and we had, we had, this was, a, this was pretty, uh, pretty close. We had Tapuri in round four, plus like 16 to one. And God knows how, how Emmett survived that round, but uh, ended up obviously a pretty good weekend for me. And uh, we're ready to get on to this next one. So one of the things that's different about, among other things, about this card is that it's only 12 fights. So when you have a 12 fight card, what, you end up having to do is be less greedy with respect to your underdogs. In other words, you know, if you, if you, if you have a 15, 16 fight card, it's not enough just to get the, the underdogs, right. You need actually underdogs that are going to have big ceilings, but because you only have 12 fights, it just becomes that, that much less likely for an underdog to win or for multiple underdogs to win that if you can get any of them, uh, it would be pretty, pretty good. As a matter of fact, uh, it's very possible that on a, a smaller uh, slate, like 11, 12 games, that you can actually get a loss and, and, and still win. So we have to be sort of cognizant of that as well. In other words, if you are going to pick um, uh, an underdog, maybe even if it's a, you know, uh, not the greatest uh, win equity in the world, if he or she rates to get a couple of takedowns to get a couple of points, um, even in a loss, I guess that, that, you know, that makes it viable on a smaller slate like this. Um, you also have a fight card with quite a few fighters with very, very strong inside the distance lines. And you also have uh, several fighters that don't have the same type of inside the distance lines, but have incredible win conditions. That being um, their sole win condition is predicated on being able to wrestle and grapple and basically rack up all the uh, DraftKings points that go along with that. So we're going to go through uh, fight by fight this time. And you'll see that there aren't that many fights that you can completely ignore. Um, most of them either have somebody with a really good inside the distance prop or uh, a really good path to, uh, to upside with respect to wrestling. Um, so what, what I find is on cards like this, it's more important, well, not more important, but it's, it's pretty important to find a good fight to fade. You know, um, rather than a great fight to target, and you'll you'll see what I mean as we kind of get to it. Uh, nonetheless, uh, let's just start right from the bottom and right off the bat in uh, uh, fight one. You have Romanov versus Ivanov, and the price is eighty three hundred seventy nine hundred. Now, normally, um, well, first we want to just double check and make sure that the win odds are kind of pure. Yeah, that, I mean Romanov's about a minus one thirty, so the the price tag from um, pure win equity is is very uh very accurate um but when you look at the inside the distance lines it doesn't tell the whole story actually sort of does um romanov's inside the distance line is extremely uh frothy in other words he, he's either plus 125 or plus 130 or plus 130 and for an 8300 fighter that is uh extremely strong uh, not to mention the fact that his inside the distance wins are going to be uh, accompanied by, by takedowns and grappling upside and things like that. So it's, it's kind of a double shot that, that even if somehow he, he wins and doesn't, you know, finish, finish the fight, he's probably going to have accomplished a whole bunch of takedowns and, and, and grappling and control time and things like that. So Romanov is a pretty elite play. Um, uh, based on the numbers here. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, Ivanov, who his inside the distance line is pretty poor. I mean, it's it's plus 
315 when you account for VIG, it's like plus 375. Now his price is, I mean, it's okay. It's 7,900, but um, I don't know. I, it just doesn't seem like a, like a very, very strong play. The only thing I would say is that it's, uh, listen, all underdogs are, are, uh, are live, I guess, this week because it's going to be so hard to get any of them home. You'll see when we get to some of these other fights, the win odds are just so high that you almost want to almost blindly play some of these underdogs with a decent chance to win. Um, so as far as his high upside, I don't think that Ivanov is, is such a great play. But just as fear as you know, having to take an underdog at all, he has good win odds, which which makes him pretty viable on a card like this. The other thing I would also say is that Romanov, I would imagine, rates to be extremely popular just because he he does have those that huge inside the distance line and the wrestling. So I imagine that at that price tag, I mean, he's going to be really popular, which means that Ivanov does pro provide for a decent amount of leverage uh, against Romanov in a situation like that. So Right off the bat, I think that both of these fighters are very viable and and almost a must. I wouldn't say a must play because there are a lot of so there are a lot of fights that can deliver here. But I think this fight should be at least close to a priority, if not if, if not an absolute priority. Um, okay. Moving on, we have Petrovic against uh, Luana Carolina, um, women's fight. Petrovic eighty nine hundred and Carolina is seventy three hundred. Um, this is uh, one where the inside the distance line is not going to tell the whole story. Um, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So it's, it's listed here as Syrich. Um, there are a couple of fights that have kind of weird spellings in, in the uh, fight odds site, but on DraftKings, they have their actual name. Uh, in any case, looking at the win odds, you have uh, minus 220. So this is probably some a, a good amount of win equity in the favorite here normally when you're like a minus 220 or something like that it's be, they put you at 9100 but because there are so many other fighters with bigger win odds that they priced her down a little bit uh Petrovic to 8900 so first of all that 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 is a pretty decent amount of win equity there in and of itself the other thing is that even though uh We'll look at the inside the distance line. You'll see it's really not that great. Um, where is this? So yeah, so Petrovic inside the distance is only a plus two forty, which is obviously well not obviously, but you you want for an eighty nine hundred dollar fighter for your inside the distance prop to be maybe like plus one twenty or something like that. So it's not that great, but because of her path to victory, that being just takedowns, 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 uh, and more takedowns. Uh, her, her win condition is extremely conducive to high scores, even if she doesn't get the finish. So Petrovic is clearly, you know, a, a very, very strong upside play, very strong favorite. Um, on the other side of this, Carolina, the only thing I would say is that maybe she has some leverage uh, as, as a play because her inside the distance prop is non-existent and her win odds aren't even that great. So at, at 7,300, I mean, you, you'd love your win odds to be closer, like plus 160 or something like that. And, and, um, and you're just not getting it. So I think Carolina, in, unless you're telling me that Petrovic is going to be extremely popular, um, I, I don't really see her as, as being playable here. The only thing I would say, again, is maybe a little bit of win equity, but even at that price... Even at even at you know plus one eighty, I don't know. I, I just think this is probably a fade. So for me, it would be Petrovic and probably nothing from the other side. So now you have Guram Kutsaladze, one of the you know, several favorites here with pretty strong um, inside the distance lines and win equity. First of all, he's minus six hundred, and there's really no price that you can put on that. You know, um, they they don't price these guys at 10-5 or anything like that. Um, but they had to give him something, so they gave him, what, 9400 And you'll see that there are, there's a guy priced higher than him because there's, believe it or not, even someone with a higher win, <laughs> with more win equity than than, than this gentleman. So 9400 what do you need? Uh, you need to have an inside the distance prop of minus 110 or better, and pr preferably a, uh, some wrestling upside as well. Otherwise, this is a very, very difficult price to pay. 
Um, and when you look at his inside the distance line, we'll take a look. I mean, it's okay. Uh, Kudalazi inside the distance, I mean, minus 110 on either side. I mean, that, that's fine. Um, it's not elite. And the fact that he is not much of a wrestler or a grappler uh, makes this makes him playable, but certainly not, you know, not a priority. What I will say is that with with the presence of other 9K fighters with kind of higher upside, I guess, we'll get to him in a minute. You could play Kutaladze as a decent pivot. Um, because listen, he does have a he looks he looks like he has pretty good metrics for like a 9k fighter or $9,100 fighter. Um, and considering he's probably going to be lower owned than than Brito, and we'll get to some others later. Um, I, I think you could use him now. The only issue here, not the only issue, but one thing I will say is that I don't think Brenner on the other side is a good play at all because number one, he doesn't have a lot of win equity, and almost no win equity relative to his price. I mean, at plus 400, he should probably be like 6K. Um, and the other problem here is that, as I mentioned, Kutaladze probably doesn't rate to be very popular, so you don't get a lot of leverage playing Brenner anyway. So uh, I would probably use Kutaladze as kind of a pivot um, off of Brito and others, but uh, I wouldn't use any of Brenner at all. All right, so Yana Santos versus Carol Hosa. Let's take a look. Uh, you have Hosa at 8,600, Santos 7,600. So we're expecting to see about minus 160 or so, minus 150. And that's what you're getting, like minus 170, some minus 160. So win odds are pretty fair. Um, you look at the inside the distance line as – with most women's fights, you're not, it's not going to look that great. So Hosa plus like 400 or something like that. So for, for Hosa to be a good play, she's really got to have a whole bunch of takedown upside. Um, now, here's the thing with, 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 with playing her, though. You know, um, I see one fight here where she had four takedowns and got a win. But then there's another one here that had, you know, zero takedowns for a win because she was able to get 125 strikes off. And then you have two fights where she got takedowns, and then the last fight where she didn't go for any. So the thing is, is that in the absence of a good inside the distance prop, which we do not have here, you've got to be sure or relatively sure that she's going to be going for that grappling heavy game plan. And it's just unclear, you know? Um, it's like that parlay. Not only has she got to get the takedowns, but she's got to attempt them in the first place. So... Uh, I'm telling you, get Hosa and and she gets like a striking based based win here, you know. Let's just say that she dominates somehow, and you get a fight like this Korea fight. I guess eighty nine is not terrible, but you're definitely sweating, you know. If if you get a win from at you know an eighty six hundred dollar fighter getting eighty nine, so it's hard enough to win. It's hard enough to get kind of, kind of a good score like that. That might not even be optimal. So, um, I think she's an okay play here. I think that uh, it's probably better, but I also would imagine this is probably going to be low owned. So we will, we'll, we'll put her in the pool, but I don't think it's going to be a priority. All right. Now, as I mentioned, moving on, we have uh, Brito versus uh, let's see, wait, not Wade Wilson, not Woodrow Wilson, but Weston Wilson. And here you have win odds of, I think minus a thousand that's for openers. Yeah, Ioannis and Brito is minus fourteen hundred. <laughs> Coming back is plus seven hundred. Um, so what, how do you price that? I mean, you can't put it at ten thousand. And then if that's not enough, you look at the inside the distance prop. Um, uh, Brito himself inside the distance is like minus three fifty. You know, and, and not only that, but Wilson inside the first round. Uh, not Wilson, I'm sorry, Brito in the first round is minus 220. I've never seen that, I think, in my life. So uh you know, what what do you what do you put what do you how do you price that one? I mean, that's the best the best you're gonna do, considering the way the pricing model works here is maybe 96, 97, maybe 9,800. Um, and listen, it's okay. So number one, it looks like a good play, right? I mean, he finishes in the first rounds. What's that? If it's minus 200 or uh, 
implied about two thirds of the time, something like that. However, let me let me let me suggest to you that uh, okay, if he knocks him out in the first rounds, which is going to happen two thirds of the time, is that how often is that going to be optimal? Like if he gets like a, if he gets a KO in a minute and thirty with no takedowns and it's ninety eight points, for example, how's that going to look? You're not going to like it. Uh, if he gets a takedown and then a huge ground and pound and it finishes in 54 seconds, yeah, I mean, you're going to want it. But let me just just you know, do a little math with you here. So 66% of the time this fight finishes in the first round, 33% of the time it doesn't. Okay, so a good one-third of the time, this, 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 this play busts, okay? Um, and if you're in contests where he can be like 50, 60 percent owned, for example, I mean, you could certainly fade him. You know, and not not to mention the fact that paying 9,600, you know, uh, you know, makes the rest of your lineup build harder. As I as I talked about earlier, there, there aren't that many great underdogs. So when you're paying 9,600 on a slate without that many great underdogs, I mean, he's got to really put up a number for you to justify that. And will he? Yeah, I mean, most of the time, but not all of the time, you know. So, uh, yeah, according to the math, very, very strong play, probably the best. Is it the best? Well, the best raw points play on the board, given all the metrics. The best going to be the best median score, I think. Um, but uh, in GPPs, considering it's going to be 50 plus percent owned, uh, you can fade it. It'll make the rest of your lineup builds a lot, uh, lot smoother. Uh, and Wilson, uh, no, he just doesn't win often enough. All right. So this one is, I like this fight a lot. Um, this is Fakhradinov against Ke uh, Kevin Lee. And you basically have a battle of wrestlers here. So Fakhradinov in his last fight, he had seven takedowns. The one before that, he had five takedowns. And then Kevin Lee, in his last bunch of fights, Three takedowns, two takedowns, zero takedowns, but that's fine because he had a, a KO in the first round. Six takedowns, three takedowns. Um, the only thing is he hasn't fought in over, over just about two years. Um, so this is this is the way I, I think of this fight, okay? Um, first of all, let's look at the win odds. You have 8,800, 7,400, so we're expecting to see about minus 190 or so. And the win odds. Let's take a look. Uh, it's actually pretty, pretty juicy. It's minus two hundred. So as far as the win odds go, you're probably actually getting a better price on him than on Petrovich, right? No, actually, it's about the same. It's about the same. About about, about the same. Um, because uh, Renat is a little bit less likely to win, but a little cheaper. That's right, fair enough. But I will say this uh, about the Kevin Lee side. I'm not saying he's going to win, but if he wins, I, I I have to imagine. Well, first of all, I was about to say, I have to imagine it's because he gets his own set of takedowns here. You know, I, but then I thought about it. I mean, it's also possible that that he can win a striking battle, I suppose. I don't imagine that he would do this, but but that's certainly in the cards. But in either case, I, I have to say that that. Kevin Lee is a very pretty reasonable underdog. You know? Let's take a look at, at, at these inside the distance lines. They're not going to look great. Um, like Fakradinov inside the distance is like plus 230, and that's no good. And Lee inside the distance plus 400, that's no good. But because of the wrestling here, it's what, ma it's what, making, it's what makes these fighters interesting from a DFS perspective. But, but I will say this, is that Fakradinov, I mean – in the if he doesn't get his takedowns, I mean there are a lot of there's a lot of variations I think where either of these fighters can win without putting up an enormous score. You know, remember we have two wrestlers kind of like wrestling each other, so it's possible that nobody really dominates this fight and the fight sort of busts. But the thing is, if the fight busts, it's you got a better chance. For it to make optimal if you're on the Kevin Lee side that wins, right? As opposed to the Renat side that wins. Like if, if the winner scores 70 and you have Renat, you're dead in the optimal. But if the if if the if the 
fight bus and Kevin Lee wins and score 70, you're, you're in competition for it. So I, I actually do like the Kevin Lee side of this um, as far as DFS goes. And and yes, I do think that back with Dean off. I mean, you can't deny those, all those takedowns. And if he gets, he really gets it going over Kevin Lee. I mean, he could put up a big, big number, but I think the Kevin Lee side is getting disrespected just a little bit. You know, I mean, if you, if you didn't have like a year and a half layoff, it's not the end. Of, first of all, it's not the end of the world. Right. The problem was he got hurt. You know, he had he had torn ACLs, right? And he got repaired and he's back, you know. So I don't know. Um if you look back here, I mean he was on pace to to, you know, not pace. I mean he was he was gonna be fighting for titles and stuff like that. Like uh, I don't know. It's so he, he got that first round K over Gillespie, then you know, what was this? A couple of months later he lost to Oliveira, but he made it to the third round with him. He took Oliveira down twice. You know, and then he, then he lost to then then he lost to Rodriguez, and that was that was kind of looked at as like a really really bad performance. But it's not as if he was a huge favorite. He was he was he was eighty five hundred, and and okay, he lost. He did get three takedowns. Um, I don't know. So for me, uh, I will take both sides, but I'm I, I really think Kevin Lee is a kind of an interesting play here. So anyway, that's that. Uh, Bruno Fajaya or Ferreira, depending on where you're from, against N N is it N N Ruzboev. He's got an incredible amount of fraudulent fights on his record. I think they're saying that he had 42 is 42 fights at the age of 26 or something like that. But no one could actually you know prove that any of these fights existed. I mean, there's sort of fishy footage on it. Um, and then you have Ferreira who who was up against uh, uh, what's his name uh, Rodriguez Greg Rodriguez. And he was a pretty big underdog there and he was getting backed up and he just came with a counter and just flattened him. So you have like all kinds of stuff going on. You have, you have recency bias with Fajaya. You got, you know, you, first of all, you have like uh Russian bias with <laughs> Ruzaboa, but then you have these fraudulent fights. So in, in situations like this, let's, let's just, let's just go back to base. Let's just go to the numbers here. So let's just first look for win odds. Uh, Fajaya minus 160 or so. So that looks about reasonable. Actually, I would say Fajaya probably has a little bit of win odds, win equity here. If he's minus 170, I mean, eh, actually, that's not true. Uh, it's I guess about reason. It's pretty reasonable. And then when you look at the inside the distance prop here, we have Fajaya inside the distance is a big fat minus 150. So you're just going to have to play that. I mean, for at his price, I would have taken a plus 200 and he's a minus 150 inside the distance. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty brutal. I, how, how is that not, not the best play on the board? I, I don't know. It just has to be. Um, I guess the only play that's better, I wouldn't say better, I mean, Romanoff's is just a good a play. So I think, I think, and then we'll get to another one later, but this type of inside the distance prop is just way too good to ignore at this price. Not to mention that he does have a little bit of takedowns as well. It's not exactly in his last fight, but I don't know. I, th I think that, that Ruzaboev, this 42 fights, I think it's like probably three quarters of them are nonsense. And uh, he's getting a little bit too much, respect because of his the way his name sounds and and the record in general so i don't know we'll, we'll talk about that in the betting breakdown but um Faye is an extremely strong play now on the other side let's take a look who's above he's plus 300 i mean you know i mean that's that's really just not good enough unless you could promise me he's gonna be going for takedowns and winning you know and all of his wins are going to involve big takedown upside i don't know and Again, I'll play him only because he's an underdog with a reasonable chance to win. But aside from that, it's not not very promising. So Pehe at 84. I mean, these are some I mean, that's a great play. So between so far, Romanov, Pehea, boy, I'd love to get in Brito. Uh, and you can, you know, but I think these two are very, very strong. Um, all right, moving up. Moving up the card, we have Israel Bonfim versus Benoit Saint Denis, and we have another one with a really, really strong, uh, some really strong internals. We'll take a look at it. So Bonfim is ninety two hundred compared to Saint Denis seven K. So you'll, well, you'll expect to see something like 
minus 240 or so. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, uh, minus 230 or so. No, this is like minus 300. So this is actually at 9,200, pretty decent amount of win equity on Bon Fiend. Um, but you need a little more than that. So, so you're going to need to have for 9,200 at least a minus 110 inside the distance prop, hopefully better. And if it came with some grappling, that would be great. But it doesn't look like Bonfim is going to be grappling this fight. So we're really just going to be predicating it on his inside the distance line. Um, when you look at it, you see Bonfim inside the distance. I mean, minus, see here it is, depends where you look. Here you can get plus 400, but here you got to lay minus 133. So it's probably a little thin, the Bonfim side, okay? The only thing I would say about Bon Fien, uh, well, two things. Number one is, again, he's going to be a pivot off of you know, something like Brito or even uh, the other uh, 8,900 guy I just talked about, I think. Um, and the other reason is I have a feeling that Santini is going to be popular. But let's take a look. We'll, we'll take a look at his internals. And his internals are terrible. I mean, it's Santini inside the distance. What is this? Plus... 600 or something like that but i think people are going to play him because he he he's very active he just put on a pretty decent performance in his last fight and he's going to be going for it and he's going to probably be going for takedowns um so yeah if in fact he wins i think it's going to be because he got a bunch of takedowns otherwise i don't see it happening however however it just doesn't happen enough I mean, it's, it's, it's like plus 300, his chance to win, or plus 250. So I, I think that Santini might end up being kind of bad shock. Uh, but who knows? Maybe maybe nobody plays him at the end of the day. But I think that as a result, I think the Bon Fiend play can carry some sneaky leverage. One, because of price that it's competing with, with kind of better options at his price tag. And um, because I do think that, uh, I don't know. I just had this feeling that Santini is going to be played, but we'll see. Ariane Lipsky versus Michelle or Melissa Gatto. So Gatto is 8,700. Lipsky is 7,500. So let's take a look at the win odds. Again, probably speculate like minus 180. So you have Gatto at minus 230, which is, I mean, it's pretty big. You know what I mean? This is what makes these underdogs so difficult to play. I mean, you're not getting such a great price on Lisky in, in the, in the win equity market, you know, um, Gatto here, if, if this were, you know, if there weren't so many other really good favorites, Gatto would have probably been 9,100 or something like that. But because there are other fighters taking up those slots and you can't have two fighters at the same price, Gatto slips down here at 8,700. So you do have a little bit of win equity there. Um, but when you look at the inside the distance lines here, I think it, it's pretty poor. You have Lipsky inside the distance, like plus, excuse me, Gatto inside the distance is plus like 130, something like that. I mean, it's not the end of the world, actually. Um, especially for a women's fight, this actually isn't that bad with big plus 150. Um, but it's definitely worse than some of the others we talked about. And again, Lipsky, I think, is, is good enough just from win odds, I guess. But again, that's no bargain, plus 200 at 8,700. Well, whatever, she is 7,500. That's just no bargain. She doesn't really have an inside the distance line worth, worth mentioning here. Lipsky inside the distance is plus 1,000. Now, I'm, I'm probably going to end up playing her inside the distance when I'm betting it, but um, not in DFS. So probably going to pass on Gato, maybe. At the very least, make it really, really small ownership. And I might play some Lipsky, just to, something to do as far as an underdog goes. But you know, the numbers certainly don't support it. You need just a little better win equity to play her. Okay, uh, now you have um, Mark Morales. No, you have Mitchell. Mar Michael Morales. He's 14 and zero. He's 9K versus Max Griffin, 7,200. So I'm expecting to see again Morales plus, you know, minus 230, minus 240, something like that. And that's exactly what we're getting. 
market. So there's no real, you know, win equity here one or the other. So at this price, though, you're expecting to see, well, you'd like to see a, an inside the distance line of about minus 110 or better. And hopefully some take that upside as well. And when you look through this, you don't really see it. You have Morales inside the distance is plus like 200. And he's not a wrestler. So for me, probably a fade if you want to know the truth. And then you have Griffin. I mean, not that we care too much about his inside the distance line here. Um, because we would just really, we would just take a win. But he is plus, plus 600 or something like that. So again, the problem with playing him is again, no one's playing Morales, you know, so you don't get any leverage on him and his internals are poor. So uh, Morales, I guess I consider him sort of a similar pivot to, you know, some of these other nine Ks we talked about that being um, maybe back with Dean off. Well, I can give him at least has to take that upside, but. Bon Feem, guys like that. Bon Feem is a little bit better, I guess, inside the distance, probably not by much. So I do rate him as kind of a kind of a uh, Morales is kind of a contrarian play, I suppose. But I'll probably end up fading it. And Griff, Griffin again, I just don't think I just don't see why I'd want to play it. I mean, it doesn't really have finish upside, doesn't have a lot of win equity, and doesn't have leverage. All right, so this next one I think is pretty interesting. You have Ismagula versus Grant Dawson, and the price is 8208K. So you're expecting it to be somewhat of a pick -em. Maybe Ismagula is a slight favorite, and yeah, it's exactly what you're getting. So you think that's kind of the end of the story, that it's pretty efficient, but but no, it's not exactly that easy. Because, look, first of all, you look at the inside the distance line, and you want to have you know at least plus 250 at these kind of pick -em prices. Um and you look at Ismagulov, it's like plus 600. I mean, that's like awful. So he's like essentially not playable. And then when you look at Dawson's inside the distance line, it's like plus 300, which obviously is not great at all. But the thing is that Dawson's path to victory is basically 100% predicated on getting takedowns. So this is a, a kind of a style bit of an it, this is This is where style analysis kind of trumps the, just the, the inside, you know, the internals because the internals don't, really have props for takedowns and control time. So, or we'd be able to derive those pretty easily. So that's the thing about the Dawson side here. I don't know if he's going to win, but if he does, it's going to be because he got those takedowns. So you just have to play. Him, okay. He's, he's just, just an incredible elite play, like right alongside of Romanoff and well, for, for a different reason, but, but these are like, these are the guys, you know, Romanoff and Dawson, if they're win condition plays, if these guys win, they're going to score well. Okay. And Fajaya, I mean, he just has a, which is a really, really strong inside of this line for his price. Um, so if you were, again, starting a cash lineup, you know, again, because all these guys, I think are going to be pretty popular. You can start with these four and one other we're going to get to. Um, now I will say this, that in a similar way that why you probably want to play even off because Romanov's going to be really popular. I think, I think you can play is off as well, because I think Dawson's going to get a ton of ownership. I mean, it just makes too much sense. So you play is off. I mean, it's, it's, it's a rough play because if he, if he plays it right, he just keeps him at range. Doesn't, Taken, it doesn't let go himself get taken down and scores like 65 in a decision, but you are going to be taking out a lot of those Dawson lineups in the process. And again, it's not as important to get the upside as it usually is, but nonetheless, I mean, that's a, that's a rough, rough uh, inside the distance line to play is Magula. So I don't know if I'm going to do that, but Dawson is, is obviously, at least to me, like one of the best, if not the best play overall. I mean, just look at even, just look at his inside. Just look at his game log. Like two takedowns, seven takedowns, three takedowns, one takedown. I mean, this is this is, this is what you want to see. Now you want you prefer to see it against better competition. You prefer to see him not draw Ricky Glenn. Um, but hey, it is what it is. So he's a very very strong. Okay, uh, and in the main event, you have Sean Strickland versus uh, Abus Magomedov. So this again is a five round fight. 
And, you know, when you have five rounds to work with, it, it becomes, you know, comes a, a difficult challenge on whether to fade it or not, especially if you want to play like Sean Strickland, because Strickland is going to be someone who really benefits from those extra rounds um, because he's not, you know, necessarily a big first or second or third round KO guy, but he can kind of rack up the volume there. Um, so a, a five round fight is going to help his um, chances to score well, much more than if it was some like wild, wild slugfest. Okay. Um, so at 8,500, I mean, he's, he's a very, very strong play. And then on the other hand, uh, Mago Metal off at 7,700. Again, main event, five rounds to work with, you know, it's, and his win odds are, I think, perfectly reasonable, right? Plus 130 or 140 at that price. Um, so you got, you probably want to play both of these, both of these guys. So that's basically the idea. Um, it, it's a very, very straightforward type of card. And I'll just kind of review it. You know, you have Romanov, Ivanov. I think Romanov's an elite play, but Ivanov's getting leverage, so you can probably play that. I think Petrovich, Karolina. I think you can fade Karolina, but Petrovich is a good favorite. I think that uh, Kutaladze is, is a good little pivot uh, off of some of the uh, more expensive guys, and I wouldn't play probably any of Brenner. Uh, Hosa over Santos, I think she's perfectly reasonable at that price. And uh, no interest in Santos. Brito. Very, very strong play. I mean, it's, it's going to be difficult to get, not difficult to get him in. I mean, you can get him in, but, you know, it makes lineup building a little harder to play a 9,600 guy. But, you know, 66% to finish in the first round is kind of tough to ignore. Um, Kevin Lee against Pat Pac- Rodinoff. I think both sides of this fight are as viable. Uh, Kevin Lee, I will not be uh, afraid to play him. Bahia, very, very strong play. Uh, and I think Ruzabov's got a little bit of leverage against him. Um, but I definitely the Fahey side. Bonfim, uh, pretty good. Uh, again, price leverage because he's nine K, so I would play him. Santini probably not going to get to the get to him. Uh, again, I think he's going to be a little. I think I think he's going to be popular, but we'll we'll see when we get to later ownership projections. Lipsky Gatto probably a pass. Um, I don't know, and maybe. maybe Maybe a little bit on both sides, but not a priority. Uh, Morales, again, only as a pivot. Otherwise, the internals are pretty poor. And Griffin, I'm, I don't think I'm playing. Uh, Magum, uh, not Magum, uh, what's his name? Uh, Romanoff, not Romanoff. Uh, ah, Dawson, elite play. Uh, very similar to Romanoff. Uh, although Romanoff carries with him more finishing upside. The Dawson win condition is is, is not to be ignored. And then both sides of the of the main event, I think, are playing. So overall, pretty, pretty straightforward, a uh, bit of recommendation, a uh, bunch of recommendations for me. And uh, that'll do it uh, tomorrow. Again, we're going to probably do uh, a betting breakdown and where we just kind of take some wild shots at contrarian plays. But until then, uh, this is Sheet signing off and good luck, everybody.